thank you, uh, Carrie, for coming up with this idea and inviting me. Uh, thanks to Shani and to the Maison uh, Francaise and to the Economics Department and to the University of Columbia. It's nice to be here. Um, and there are a lot of old friends uh, in the audience. Um, basically, this is this is like a really weird project because it, it actually started while I was it started while I was working on all these different things. I'm not an economist, and it actually started because I'm such a bad accountant. I was actually, I can't tell the whole story because it's too humiliating, <laughs> but I found myself in deep financial trouble um, while studying Jean-Baptiste Colbert um, because I was such a poor accountant. And I was studying Colbert doing amazing accounting, which I'm going to talk about briefly. And I was like, what? And I was like, how can this be happening? You know, I mean, how can someone who goes to, you know, these, uh, gets a major PhD in the modern age, you know really nothing about this. And economists, you don't realize how little people do know about this. And I became sort of more fascinated by this odd sort of disconnect in modern education with accounting. Um, and then, um, so a couple things happened. Um, essentially, one thing that sort of struck me, well, I'll just sort of tell the story. I was um, studying uh, 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 Louis XIV and Colbert's relationship and how Colbert made an information system, and, and partly for himself, but also for, for Louis XIV. I'm actually just going to skip ahead here and show you this. And um, so this, basically, I was stunned to find that in Colbert's own hand, he had actually copied out long passages from um, uh, 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 the sort of first printed uh, manual on accounting by Pacioli for Louis XIV, which Louis XIV read. He wrote about to his mother. He wrote about how much he loved being able to do accounting. I mean, this is, these are unbelievable letters, which of course no one cares about because they're about, about accounting. Then um, Colbert did something much more extraordinary. He went to um, Jarry's studio, and Jarry was, Nicolas Jarry was responsible for doing the Guirlande de Julie, which in the 17th century is one of the, perhaps the most beautiful work of calligraphy of the 17th century. Um, and Colbert had actually helped him produce this. There's an amazing, Sort of portrait of Colbert in this book. And he had um, Jarry's studio make for Louis XIV these golden notebooks. They're bound in Marocain, but they have gold clasps in the Bayan, the Bibliothèque Nationale. Doesn't like you to ever see them. And the reason was that they know that they're there. And, and, and when I asked to take the pictures, I said, yeah, but nobody else does. And that, that they didn't care. And so I had to threaten and menace them. And they let me, it was a long, stressful, you know, kind of bod fail between me and whatever. But I got the pictures, and I was stunned by these books. For 20 years, Louis XIV keeps these basic account books in his pocket. They are basically income and expenditure, um, and then they actually have his capital holdings, which I also know that he knew enough about land and what things were worth to understand these capital holdings very, very well in the back of each book. For 20 years, Louis XIV holds these in his pocket. Um, and that's already amazing, because kings didn't do that. I, and I'm writing a book about this now. There's a whole reason that kings don't look at account books. Philip II bragged that he looked at every piece of information on earth, but he didn't touch the account books. There was, the, the Spanish did accounting everywhere, but not Philip II. All information interested him, except accounting. This was not a thing that was seen as a good thing to do. Accounting was associated, at least for high aristocrats, as a kind of lower uh, mercantile thing. So for Louis XIV to take a joy in this and to do it for 20 years seemed to me to be sort of a grand moment in the history of statecraft. And there was enough evidence to show that this was the case. This happened. It was a, it was a fairly big deal. But what was even more interesting to me, and this sort of coincided with my own personal incompetence, lack of knowledge, disconnect from accounting, was that Louis XIV, when Colbert dies, he ends the books. He doesn't just end them. He ends the actual system by which he could get good accounts. And he breaks up uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance from the Ministry of the Navy and actually kind of breaks it up from other things too, like the Royal Library, which is really necessary, believe it or not, for accounting because so many legal texts are going in and out of it. Um, so Louis XIV essentially makes or stops reforms or breaks up institutional uh, 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 
frameworks which would allow him to actually understand his accounts well, or at least anybody else to understand them. Another reason was really, you know, in the, in the years leading up to Colbert's de death in 1683, the financial news just kept getting worse, and, and Louis XIV just didn't like it. Um, and this, by the way, is no small deal. This is a great human trait that we like to drop the account books when they start getting bad, um, or perhaps change them around. Um, so I was sort of stunned by this, and I put it aside, and I said, this is really interesting, um, and, and I want to understand more about just, because this king, this sort of, you know, divine right monarch who secretly writes letters to his mom about how he loves accounting, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is not how we see Louis XIV in his youth, you know, having love affairs in rivers covered with rose petals, you know, as Dumas liked to sort of tell it. No, he was sitting, learning this account stuff, um, we also know that Louis XIV loved the so-called métier du, the, the métier du roi, the business of being king. Yeah, well then why did he destroy his system? So there are all these sort of questions in here which really, really interested me. And I was like, you know what, I think there's a project in here. And so I sort of started digging. Now just one sort of note. Um, hold on here. Then, this is just a sort of side note. As this sort of project was happening, the financial crisis happened. Um, lots of financial crises have happened all over the place. But, and you'll understand why this interested me after this paper. Um, one of the things that stunned me the most as I was studying um, uh, basically the interest in numbers in government and the representation of good government by numbers was the fact that in our, in our own political discourse, numbers had taken on a very strange and odd role. And when uh, uh, America's credit rating was downrated by the S&P, two hours later, uh, 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 some assistant guy in um, the Treasury Department said, hey, there's a $2 trillion error. And I was like, all right, this is what I'm studying. And so I, ran, and so I ran to the Treasury Department website, and this is what they gave. Okay, This is it, besides a few explanations. Then I said, this is going to be great. There's going to be this 18th century style debate about numbers and how some people calculate the deficit or spending and how some people do it differently. And so I went to the Wall Street Journal. I went to Bloomberg. Just some vague stuff, 5% difference, um, you know, how much revenue is going to come in. It was incredibly vague. And I was like, wait a minute. We're literally, the United States of America is getting downgraded. It's credit rating. We're having a debate about a $2 trillion error. There are no numbers floating around. There are no calculations. And, no, and the weirdest thing is no one's asking for them, because I'm a cultural and intellectual historian. So I was like, wow, no one is asking for them. Is that we all, we all understood what happened? Is that what it was? Do we care that there was a $2 trillion error? Doesn't this seem like something of staggering enormity that would be a central thing in political discourse? And what I found was it wasn't. And I was like, wow, you know, this is really interesting. There is a problem. There's a disconnect between accounting and politics. There's an odd relationship between it. And this book sort of, sort of takes form from this funny relationship. And so what I want to show you today is this kind of key moment um, in the relationship between politics, publicity, and we could call them the numbers of accounting. We could call them... Um, we could call it computing, or we could call it the ersatz numbers, just numbers in general and what they represent um, politically. Um, so essentially what happened is, I was like, look, you know, we know we get to a point, we know we get to a point where in governments people start becoming judged as, you know, uh, uh, leaders by their management of spending, deficits, and finance. When does a good politician or a good leader become a good manager of public finance, okay, public finance. Um, and there were examples, but I was more interested not only in, in, you know, when a good leader is associated not with prowess and virtue and, and, and representing a nation in a certain way or winning a war, but in this relationship with numbers and leadership. But I was also interested just in the idea of when did this language come about? that we're going to start talking about the state and its health in numbers, whether we understand them or not, 
the state won't be represented necessarily uh, as a dynastic state or as a state you know, connected to a king or connected to an ideal or in the 20th century to an ideology, but also just this idea, this kind of very almost you know, possibly scary idea of a state represented by numbers. Um, well, we know that there's the birth of statistics in the 18th century, but again, I wanted to know when people start talking about a certain kind or showing numbers as political virtue. So I said, well, obviously it doesn't happen in France. So I looked everywhere else. <laughs> um, and I go back to Italy, and I, I, and I had to dig deep into Dutch history, and it was impossible. I spent like a year not being able to really master 17th century Dutch. And in spite of this MacArthur, I still failed at it, you know. I know, what kind of genius? I was like, luckily they didn't know about that. You know, so um, um, uh, I, I, um, I looked at the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the rise of political economy and the first authors of political economy. I looked at the, the authors of, of political arithmetic and statistics. I studied the work of, of Will Derringer, who's uh, in the audience here, who's doing one of the best PhDs I've ever seen uh, on these questions in England at the beginning of the 18th century. Um, and he's going to be here in the Society of Fellows now. And uh, you guys should just hire him, because you're not going to get work better than that on the open market right now. Um, so, and I, and I found in his work, and we've discussed it, that the English really discussed numbers politically in this incredibly sophisticated way at the beginning of the 18th century. But there's no echo of it. It doesn't hold, okay? So you have incredible figures like Peter de la Cour in Holland writing perhaps one of the most moving and forgotten about works of Republican theory, uh, 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 where, he, where he correlates uh, uh, good republics with basically good accounting. Um, uh, uh, there are other works uh, in the late 17th and early 18th century which you sort of think, look, this is it. This is going to be the beginning of this. And each time what sort of startled me was these beginnings, these books, uh, uh, like Peter de la Cour's book and then uh, um, um, your guys, Cruikshank and Hutchison. They're not that well known. They should be. In the history of finance and government, those guys are innovators. Okay. But as, a, again, a sort of historian of politics and culture, I was like, this is amazing. I'm studying all of Europe, and I'm not finding this. It must have started somewhere. And so, of course, I just went back to Paris to drink, because <laughs> I couldn't find what I was looking for. I was like, you know, another project bites the dust. And I went to the library, and, um, and I started looking into the 18th century in France. And I knew that there were numbers out there. And I was like, you know, maybe they start here. And I knew about Jacques Necker's Compte Rendu. And I had read about it. And actually, some of the best work about it has never been published. It's actually in Bob Darton's PhD, which is, uh, 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 I just got digitized at Harvard. Bob goes some way with it. But it was, this was interesting. And so what happened is I started dig digging into Necker. And I started finding this was, I believe, this sort of major, major moment where political discourse and the numbers of accounting become fused and become wildly popular. So it's not the first time, but it's this kind of incredible moment where government and good government, quite literally those words, it's not the first time they're used together, but it becomes public, it spreads across Europe. And then what I'm going to try and show you today is it becomes a movement, a movement so extreme within the French government um, that a, a tradition, an institutional tradition is formed that becomes so strong that even the English, for once, look to France and actually send people to France, as I'll tell you at the end, to say, wow, how did you guys do this? And one of the reasons French public uh, 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 financial management and the vision, this modern vision of the state, come from a moment of political publicity. Uh, and so that's what uh, I want to talk about today. Um, now, what's amazing is, is the Comte Rendu uh, uh, by Necker, uh, 1781, the, the, the Comte Rendu au roi, the accounts rendered to the king, not to the public, to the king, is one, um, is, is an amazing, uh, uh, is an amazing work. 
Now, essentially, what I wanted to also do was I wanted to try and understand this sort of long history of the French relationship to numbers. And I found something even more, even sort of bizarre. And this is something we don't necessarily usually uh, uh, talk about, is deep within the French government for 100 years, there had been an argument about whether to define the state through the numbers of accounting. Nobody knows about this because these are internal memos. They're internal memos which are hundreds of pages long. They often include long um, uh, uh, double entry accounts which explain that the only way to do good government is through this kind of accounting, which is what your guys kind of do in England in the same period around 1716. In, in 1716 in France, the, these financiers called the Paris Brothers basically make this internal argument. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, the French crown and ministers agree that these guys will come in and do these accounting reforms. Um, and so they start, and one of these, and this is sort of an amazing, this is just a kind of, I'm, I'm actually not reading the paper now, so it's a little out of order. but. I'll get back to, uh, there. there is uh, Necker presenting the accounts to the king. There he is being called Monsieur Deficit. Um, and I'll get back to this. But the Paris brothers do all these internal memoirs. And again, I had them digitized and, and, and printed them. They're stacks like this. And it actually took me months to read them because it was just brutally boring for uh, an intellectual historian to read through these things. But I had to do it. Um, they have classical and medieval history because it's financial history, but at the end of it, they really just get to the numbers uh, uh, and they do this accounting. Miraculously, but before John Law and after John Law, they get laws made that essentially every member of the financial class has to learn how to do double entry bookkeeping. And they get this made into a law. And when is this take? What's the year? 1716 and then 1723. They come in before John Law and right after John Law and the Mississippi bubble, essentially. They get these laws made, which are printed and some of them posted on walls, okay? Um, models to make registers and journals. Um, and, and basically, and it's it, and how to do it in double entry. And they explain how to do it. Each time, law thwarts them first. And then everybody else thwarts them again in 1723. These laws never really take effect, but they're published. They're completely forgotten by economic historians. Only one accounting historian in France has ever published on this. And yet within the government, there's a mass of, of, of work on this, and there are published laws on it. These things never took hold. When we get to the physiocrats in France, credited by many as the early inventors of uh, economic thought, they will produce Turgot, who, by the way, tried to do a lot of these same accounting reforms, and, and I'll mention that again, uh, uh, and you know, as a kind of basis of, of, of the work of Adam Smith. They like to throw around sort of economic tableau, and they, but they didn't like these numbers. In fact, those numbers were too associated with people who were connected to Colbert. And so you had a few Colbertistes, a guy named Forbonnet, who's an amazing guy, whose work looks a lot like Cruikshank's because he talks about the amortisement of debt um, and, and, and other things. He produces a, a, a long work on a, accounting in the state, but he says, I have to do this from the exterior. I can't get these numbers. So he produces this really remarkable work. It's only published twice, and it does not have a huge echo. And so I was like, wow. So the Comte Rendu, which I'm about to describe to you, like, you know, this, this thing sort of comes out of an odd vacuum in France. And I became more and more interested by it. Um, hold on here. Um, and so essentially, I went back to Necker and I tried to understand this context in which um, Necker uh, does something that really, really uh, no one had ever uh, done before. Um, Necker comes in to government, as I think many people know, uh, in, at the height of the uh, uh, American War of Independence. It's the same moment that both the English and the French are having financial crises to pay for this war. And the French uh, bring Necker in um, due to his popularity um, and due to his relationship with uh, Geneva and other bankers um, to secure loans. Um, I was actually recently uh, in Lausanne uh, with a whole bunch of Swiss people. 
And um, it's really interesting because they were talking about these moments when parts of Switzerland owned France and England. And there's just these sort of amazing moments. So to bring in this Swiss financier uh, makes an enormous uh, amount of sense. Um, not only that, Necker um, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, his wife had a very well-known salon. It was before his daughter, Madame de Stael, came into her own. He was well seen among philosophers. He was a popular figure amongst uh, many. Um, and essentially, he's brought in uh, uh, in uh, the 1780s to do the reforms exact, almost exactly to some extent that the Paris brothers and uh, uh, Turgot had failed to do, which is to try and get the financiers <laughs> to keep double entry books so they could actually figure out tax receipts and just to figure out how much money the government actually had and was spending. Simple stuff, but not if, if, if you don't use, nobody uses double entry, it's not very simple. Um, so what he does is he tries to install a centralized system of tax collection and auditing. Um, uh, uh, and this threatens everyone who's involved with finance, because everyone has a hand in this pot. Um, the parliament ha has a hand in this pot because they have to, uh, uh, they get cuts from the financiers and they have to register certain things. Um, uh, high nobles have uh, an interest in the accounts not being good because everyone's worried about getting taxed. And so no one wants clear accounting done at any point. And I'm, and I'm kind of exaggerating. There are other nobles that do want it. But really, at the end of the day, there's a great movement against, against these reforms, which threaten so many entrenched uh, financial interests. Um, he tries to streamline the tax in postal farms and cuts the number of venal administrators to save the crown enormous uh, revenues lost to feudal office holders. Um, and he does eliminate three quarters of the 48 tax collectors, as you saw, into 12 heavily audited officers. Um, and so this centralizes state accounting. Um, and he even threatens just to get rid of much of the financial class of the Ancien Regime. Um, now, as he's trying to do this, as is the great French tradition, especially at this time, he starts getting attacked in the pamphlet press. Um, and this goes on for a little while and Necker can hold out. Um, and essentially, um, this movement of, uh, uh, I mean, this movement of pamphlets will be called the necromanie, uh, a necromania uh, around uh, uh, Necker. But what happens is slowly he starts getting dragged through the mud. He sort of stays, you know, uh, on Olympus for a while, but in 1780, uh, one, uh, uh, Sorry, it's a, a 1781 libelous anonymous pamphlet stands out. And it is by this guy uh, named Jacques Mathieu Augéard. And Augéard writes something called the anonymous letter from Monsieur Turgot to Monsieur Necker, which is filled with lots of financial information. It's a narrative of Necker's bad administration, but it has numbers and it has bits and pieces of accounts. And it does more. So it has numbers and it looks really plausible. It looks like the person, it looks like it was a leak, okay? It looks like it came from within the government. The government is and doesn't produce financial numbers. So this has quite an effect, but he goes further and he attacks Necker as a Swiss banker bent on draining money from the state. He says that um, he has taken people's fortunes away and has, he himself has a huge, huge fortune and he names numbers. And then he says, you know, this is a citizen of Geneva who knows better than I and everyone else the ABCs of the business of keeping um, of accounting and keeping registers? He says he has an esprit encyclopédique, and that this really is nothing more than the little calculation of banks and money. So he throws it's, it's a it's a brilliant move. He throws numbers at him and then says, but all this guy cares about are these little calculations. So it's a double move, and this hurts Necker. Um, uh, uh, Augier himself called the pamphlet a devilish success. Uh, Madame du Defont said that 6,000 copies appeared immediately, went throughout the court. Necker was hit and he had to uh, react. Even more than that, uh, Augier publishes, uh, and this is strong, a tableau comparatif of the laws passed by John Law and by Necker. This is after everything. And what it says is these are the same laws He's going to bring us to financial ruin. P 
people should be panicking about this guy. So this is a real attack on Necker. And Necker basically has to respond. He's got to do something. Um, he couldn't keep his hands clean. Um, and Necker is really is a brilliant guy. I mean, his writings might not be fantastically brilliant, but he understood the world of Parisian, and actually, more than that, of, of European information. He understood credit. He understood a lot of things. And he came up with this brilliant move to publish uh, the Comte Rendu. Voilà. Um, in fact, this was the kind of gesture that Vergen, the foreign minister, had worried that he would do when he was appointed, because this was an enlightened guy. Um, and he did it without um, royal permission, even though it, uh, it um, um, even though it uh, 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 was published. And essentially what he did is he claimed to reveal the veritable accounts of the government. And he hoped that, quote, this publicity would restore public confidence in his administration by shining light on the obscure writings and the mystery of state of finance. And what he does is he uses this old traditional political language of Tacitism, and by the way, of Machiavellianism and Tacitism. He even has in some of the Comte Rendu big quotes by Tacitus on the front. So veils have been put uh, over government. He's going to unveil them with this Comte Rendu. Um, uh, and this will be a moral act, he says, of moral, prosperous, happy, and powerful government. Um, at the end of his calculations, and here are his, here are his, here is his Comte Rendu, he comes up with this résultat, which we can't see very well, which is uh, 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 um, uh, his calculation is revenues exceed expenditures by 10,200,000 livres. Uh, and this shows the power and the prosperity of not only the sovereign but his subjects. So he literally says, this 10 million livres shows the power of Louis the Sixteenth. Um, this had amazing uh, success. Uh, uh, 60,000 copies. Pan Coop, the publisher uh, 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 of the uh, of various encyclopedie, uh, printed 60,000 copies in a week. Okay. More than 100,000 copies were sold in 1781 alone. Some were translated across Europe. Um, my friend Sophus Reiner who counts many of these financial publications. He thinks that there are hundreds of thousands of copies of the Comte Rendu running through Europe. It was a literal media phenomenon. Uh, and one of the things I know is that they were read by princes and princes like Pietro Leopoldo, of, uh, 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 who was perhaps in some ways the most successful enlightened prince of his age, um, actually, uh, once his own rendiconto uh, in Florence uh, of, of, of financial things. So it has a huge, huge echo. Um, now, to sort of move forward, he was immediately attacked. And Vergen actually says to Louis XVI, how could you have let this happen? We can't let this go on. He's attacking reason of state. He's attacking the secret and the mystery of monarchy itself. Monarchy, which was supposed to be the will of the king is now being shown. He literally said, your power is in the, the, these numbers. This is a bad thing. Um, so there is a realization. Um, it takes a little while for uh, Necker's uh, 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 foes to pick this up. Um, but basically, um, by 1787, uh, uh, so years go by, Necker loses his ministry, uh, uh, and other ministers come in. And in 1787, the, the, uh, the controller general of finances of uh, Cologne finds himself in a position in front of the assembly of, of notables where he has to defend this massive state deficit. And he produces another book, a Comte Rendu against Necker, in which he comes up with loads of numbers and basically says, look, this deficit that I'm dealing with is Necker's deficit. And Necker did not include 46 million 329 thousand pounds in his Comte Rendu. And so essentially a war of numbers goes on between Necker and Cologne. And this is when this really takes off. Because interestingly at first Necker's Comte Rendu is taken kind of seriously. The fact is is that while some of the calculations were good, it really was missing this giant 45 million livre uh, uh, hole. 
Necker comes back with his own calculations, and one of the things he says, which is sort of terrifying, he says, look, look, first of all, there's no way to, to really make these calculations because I never could make my reforms. So no one did double entry bookkeeping, so I couldn't actually get the real numbers. Not only that, this is a tricky genre. Huh? We always have to be careful with numbers. So he more or less sort of tries to undermine the genre, and then he says, look, of course I didn't mention those numbers. Those were the numbers that had to do with war, and war is extraordinary. That's real reason of state. And I didn't want to risk the state's uh, uh, reason of state by doing this. This only essentially uh, 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 sets off a war over numbers. And then something happens. Um, essentially, in, 17, uh, uh, in 1788, a number of leaks start coming out of the government um, of, the, of kind of uh, 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 basically budget, state budgets are leaked out. So they actually have the year of income and expenditure get leaked out by a guy named Maton de la Cour. Um, and he says, Maton de la Cour says, look, this has never happened. Not only that, we didn't even know how to print these things. It's all manuscript. But oh, we have to do this now. We have to unveil all these mysteries. Because everyone just goes by rumors and unjust reproaches happen. And we can't have a rational argument unless the real numbers are out there. Um, and so essentially, uh, by 1789, a flurry of, uh, 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 of Contrôle News come out. And then even more, a number of works equating good government with accounting uh, and double entry accounting come out. Uh, 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 the new Encyclopédie Méthodique, the, which I think is, I'm going to argue, the cruel encyclopedia of the 18th century, um, which not that many people reference, but it's the second Encyclopédie that comes out, which is never finished, and Pont Coupe loses a million leave for doing it. It basically has a whole s s three volumes on finance and commerce, and it takes up accounting and these accounting reforms and really starts talking about the state in this new way. Rather than commerce and finance as these kind of grand philosophical things, they become these kind of very technical things deeply linked to accounting uh, and the use of double entry. Um, now, Necker, I think as many people know, uh, is dismissed on the 11th of J July, 1789. Uh, this and the, the fear that troops are being massed around Paris leads to people uh, crowding around the Bastille several days later. So Necker and his polarity uh, are very important things. Uh, after the fall of the Bastille, uh, two days later, Necker is called back to his office and he publishes more Comte Pondu but as the revolution picks up steam and as the National Assembly is born, Necker sort of fades from view. However, contendus don't, and they remain a central genre of political language. And the idea that good government is linked to good accounting becomes enshrined in all the revolutionary uh, uh, constitutions. Uh, the Constitution of 1791 stipulates the detailed accounts of the expenditures of ministerial departments signed and certified by the ministers or general managers shall be rendered public by being printed at the beginning of the sessions of every legislature. The, sh the same shall apply to statements of receipts from diverse taxes from all public revenues, i.e. every thing that happens in government has to be measured by accounting and then published in a cult rendu. It says in a cult rendu. So the cult rendu becomes essentially a constitutional, which is really quite extraordinary. By 1793, um, uh, 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 it, it comes back in. Uh, it comes back in, and the Convention puts together a, a, a commission on accounting. But it has a problem, and this is a problem that the Dutch and the English and the Florentines don't have: is accounting in France is still done in internal uh, uh, family companies. There are there are accounting firms. But you don't have people floating around, numbers of them, who are highly trained double entry um, uh, accountants. While in England, there are a thousand, by the end of the 18th century, there are a thousand writing schools for commoners and for gentlemen alike. Um, so France has this sort of grave disadvantage. And so the commission writes about this. And the commission on accounting says, look, we're going to get these commissars, commissaire, wrong word, sorry. Um, uh, Sorry, this is, these are the, this is the fight between uh, Turgo and Necker, all done fighting with numbers. Um, and, and here are some of the uh, amazing comptes rendu and works that come afterwards. Um, but this commission that comes out 
that might have actually been it, but I just pressed the button, so it's going to change. Sorry, there's, there's, a, there's a plethora of works. Um, so here's the project for the organizing the Bureau of Comptabilité. And what's beautiful at, at, is at the end, they produce their account of how much it cost, uh, 499,001 livres. And they say it's really expensive because we had to train everybody from scratch. And to train credible double entry auditors is really, really expensive. And it is expensive. But it's beautiful because as a, per, according to the Constitution now, every act that you do has to be accounted for. Um, and so this, this happens. And literally, we get this massive, uh, we get this massive explosion of, of cult rendus everywhere in government. Um, Saint-Just, during the terror, would call paperwork demonic and a hindrance to revolutionary government. Um, and we, we know that that's true. And uh, 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 however, um, Republican accountability remains, though. And after the terror, it comes back uh, in force. And there are amazing, I don't have time to talk about this, but there are amazing political battles in which people attack. For example, the, 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 the ministry of the Ar Minister of the Army, the General Chereur, who's actually trying to reform accounting within the army, the people who he's going after attack him with a cult rendu, which is really deadly because they publish this thing. It says cult rendu of General Scherer and basically his corrupt administration. And Scherer has to produce a whole bunch of cult rendus in, in response, and he eventually goes down. Um, uh, and a number of people, uh, 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 for example, uh, 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 Hamed, who is a uh, Minister of Finance, he's attacked as well. And in order to defend himself, he too produces his own compte rendu. So this goes on, this idea of the compte rendu as political language. But there's something even sort of deeper that happens within the government. And this was actually, in some ways, the funnest part of this project, is that, um, so again, it just keeps going. They're just You can just dig into these, into these uh, uh, works, which, by the way, in many cases, when you go into the collections in France and in America, of revolutionary uh, uh, documents, they've never been opened because they all say accounting on them. And, 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 and no, nobody cares. They just say compte rendu, compte rendu. Luckily, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, they have the McClure collection. And at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I'm friends with the people in the rare book room. And uh, I think it was last Christmas, I got drunk with them at the Christmas party. And, um, and I was like, I'm doing this project. And can't figure it out. It was kind of one of these conversations. I'm, I'm actually simulating the, the conversation as it went. And they were like, why don't you come back into the stacks? And I was like, all right, let's go. And so we go back into the stacks. And there's just this huge, because they have this giant collection of revolutionary pamphlets. It's a beautiful collection. And luckily, there's this whole shelf that says finance. And on that shelf, there are several shelves. But one of the shelves just say compte rendu. There's literally a shelf of compte rendu. Half of the shelf of compte rendu are individual compte rendu by deputies and any agent of the state. There are hundreds of them. These are the ones just collected by this guy McClure's agent during the revolution. He was a Philadelphian who had been in uh, uh, Paris and said, this revolution is important. I made a lot of money. I'm going to get as much information on it as I can. Hundreds of these things. Every single person that goes on mission for the government has to produce basically these one to three page compte rendus where they uh, essentially, um, they kind of confess. It's like a miniature confession uh, uh, of um, uh, what they do. And on one occasion, uh, the deputy Albert from the Department of Love and Le Maine explains how he took 9,999 livres from the treasury, spent 1,262 on transport, 16,958 on food and lodging for 25 days, and 617 for aid to the poor, plus ça change. Um, this cost him 14,825 uh, uh, livres, more than he had taken. Therefore, he's deposited his receipts to the Inspector du Palais. He returns his coach and his cow to the National Depot, and he's waiting for his uh, to be reimbursed. But nonetheless, this is published, and it's published uh, uh, by the, the, the imprimerie of the so hundreds of these things come out. So essentially, every agent of the government is forced to think about their acts in these kind of very simplistic and basic terms 
of accounting and this kind of confession, the Republican confession of accounting. And at the higher scale, all the ministers have to uh, uh, produce these very detailed comptes rendu. Uh, and Israel Wallach actually um, has told me that a lot of these comptes rendus, they, they really work. A lot of them are audits. They make a huge difference. They don't stop corruption by any means. And we all know the more accounting that's done, the more corruption you can do if you're clever. I mean, it, but he said there really is this amazing moment where provincial tax receipts and management do get better because everyone has to produce these comptes rendus and send in their receipts. Um, so, and there, by the way, there is this long, long reference, series of references to Necker's comptes rendus. People will often say, like Necker's comptes rendus, there is a real consciousness that this begins with Necker. Um, so by the time we get to uh, 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 basically the end of the Napoleonic era, France starts putting into place a, 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 the beginnings of a modern um, a system of public accounting with true balance sheets. Um, and what's really ironic, and I'm, I'm going to conclude here, what's really ironic is that uh, 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 the, the Comte d'Artois, who had been Necker's most terrible foe, because in the Comte Rendu, he talked about the money that the crown paid to Artois, and he also talked about um, how much the princes of the royal blood ate, and the, and the, and the frais de table of the Maison Royale. So these guys already are rich, and they're getting huge amounts of money, and Artois hated them, and in fact paid for a lot of these pamphlets against him. Weirdly, Charles X, no one looks for for these things, gets this guy, the Marquis de Diffray, and the Marquis de Diffray comes in and really working on this huge tradition of comptes rendus, and he says that he's doing this, creates one of the first, if not the first large scale um, national budget based on double entry accounting. It's not the first national budget, but it's so large scale that in 1830, Sir John Bowering of uh, the British Commission that's been put together to put together their reform bill, Bowering, by the way, one of the most fascinating figures of the early part of the 19th century. He supposedly speaks 200 languages, will become governor of Hong Kong, and fights for local rights in Hong Kong. But he's also an expert in accounting. He goes to uh, 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 Paris, works with Dodi Frey, and many of the accounting reforms, because he wants to see a large-scale centralized accounting reform and how it works. Um, and he reports these, and these amazing detailed reports, back to the commission uh, uh, on accounting. Uh, in England. Um, so essentially, I mean, this is a sort of chapter of my book. Um, you know, does it help us understand uh, 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 how accounting works? Well, one of the things that I think is interesting here, um, I, you know, economic historians who are more economic historians than I can, can explain to what extent these reforms actually work and what they produce as far as the, you know, the creation of wealth and industry, these are different questions. But as far as the creation of a language and a system and an ethos based on accounting, this moment uh, uh, that Necker begins and really takes fire in 1787 uh, has great ramifications, not only on the continent, but in England, which is not usually how we sort of see the story. And the English are more advanced. But as far as the centralizing process goes, they're fascinated by what the French do. And there's an incredible symbiosis of government development towards accountability uh, and financial management between these uh, two uh, states, and, and then Florentine states, and German states. I mean, people are looking the other uh, And I don't mention there's, there's a whole massive history of this. Um, but does this guarantee financial stability and true accountability? I mean. You get to 1832 and these incredible reforms are there, and then we look at what happens in our own time. We look at the Greek accounts. I have a friend that actually went into audit Greek banks five years ago, uh, uh, and he told me the, the situation. He said it's beyond what anyone can imagine. And when he told the Greeks this, he had to get a bodyguard in London. Um, because you know, he said these guys are complete disaster in Greece. And he was his life was threatened. So do state accounts produce accountability? Well, not if they're false. Um, one of the things, what we do get in the 19th century, the precise moment, I think, since it's the, you know, the, the, the uh, bicentennial of, 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 uh, of, of Dickens, um, you know, Dickens, Balzac, and many writers, um, and 
actually Defoe before them mentioned this problem, this conundrum of accounting, that it gives you this assurance. But of course, behind it is actually, as Balzac, because he used the metaphor, is really this human comedy. And, you know, and basically, we're still living it.